Hey everyone, thank you for joining us online for today's conversation with Romalyn Ante, Will Harris, and April Yee. My name is Lily Philpott. I'm the Programs Manager at AEWW, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual event space. Uh, please take a moment, let us know in the chat where you are watching from. We would love to hear. For those of you who are new to the Asian American Writers Workshop, we are a nonprofit organization dedicated to uplifting Asian diasporic literature and storytelling. You can visit aaww.org, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, where the recording of this event will be posted. During the event, we ask that all audience members practice nonviolence in the chat. Comments that are racist, transphobic, homophobic, ableist, and or misogynist will be flagged and the person will be removed from this event. We will have time for audience Q&A at the end of the hour. You can ask your questions throughout the conversation via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Books are for sale, thanks to our friends at Books Are Magic. We believe are the only US distributors of Romalin's book, but we hope that that will change shortly, if not now, then very soon. You can find a link to purchase books in the chat and you can support our poets in an independent bookstore in doing so. I'm gonna briefly introduce Rom Romalyn, Will, and April, and then I hope you will join me in welcoming them on screen. Romalyn Ante grew up in Batangas, the Philippines. She migrated to the UK when she was 16 years old. She is a West Midland-based poet and co-founding editor of Hirana Poetry. She is also a poetry editor at Ambit Magazine and a Poetry Ambassadors 2021 mentor. She is the first East Asian to win the International Poetry Prizes Poetry London, judged by Kwame Dawes, and the Manchester Poetry Prize in 2017. Her debut collection is Anti-Emetic for Homesickness, which is long listed for the Dylan Thomas Prize alongside Rendang. She currently works full-time as a specialist nurse practitioner. Will Harris is a London-based writer of Chinese, Indonesian, and British heritage. He has had work published in the LRB, Poetry Daily, The New Republic, and Spam. He co-edited the spring 2020 issue of the Poetry Review with Mary Jean Chan. His first full poetry book, Rendang, is published by Granta in the UK and by Wesleyan in the US, the US version. It was selected as a Poetry Book Society choice, won the Forward Prize for Best First Collection, is shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize, longlisted for the Rathbones Folio Prize, and longlisted for the Dylan Thomas Prize, along with Romalyn's book. We wish you best of luck with all of these competitions. Um, and finally, our event curator and moderator, April Yi, is a writer and translator, literary translator with work in Newsweek, Electric Literature, and Lunch Ticket. A Harvard and Tin House alumna, she has reported in more than a dozen countries before moving to the UK, where she serves as a fiction reader for Triquarterly, a regular contributor to the blog of Plowshares, and a mentor for the Refugee, Refugee Journalism Project at University of the Arts, London. Um, welcome everyone. Please join me in welcoming April, Romalan, and Bill. Thank you so much, Lily. Thanks for the amazing introduction. And Will and Roma, I'm so excited to be here today with you discussing your amazing collection. Um, I was hoping we could first set the scene for our readers who are not in the UK today and um, read two of your poems. Um, Will, yours, Holy Man, um, that I feel is really embodied in the streets of London, and Roman uh, Mastering English. Would you like to go ahead? Great, and um, just quickly, thank you for, I'm really honored to share this space with everyone here. And thank you for everyone who's out there in the ether. Holy man. Everywhere was coming down with Christmas. The streets and window displays ethereal after rain, but what was it? October? Maybe I'd been thinking about why I hated Tibetan prayer flags and whether that was similar to how I felt about Christmas. Things become meaningless, severed from the body of ritual, of belief. And I thought about those who see kindness in my face or see it as unusually calm which must have to do with that image of the Buddha, smiling. I turned off Regent Street and onto Piccadilly, then down a side road by Costa to German Street, where a man caught my eye as I was about to cross the road and asked to shake my hand. You have a kind face, he said. Really? He was wearing a diamond-check golfer's jumper and said he was a holy man. 
As soon as he let go, he started scribbling in a notepad, then tore out a sheet, which he scrunched into a little ball and pressed his forehead and the back of his neck before blowing on it, once, sharply, and giving it to me. I see kindness in you, but also bad habits. Am I right? Not drinking or drugs or sex, not like that, but bad habits. 2020 will be a good year for you. Don't cut your hair on a Tuesday or Thursday. Have courage. He took out his wallet and showed me a photograph of the temple in front of which stood a family. His, I think. A crowd of businessmen flowed around us. Name a color of the rainbow, any color, except red or orange. He was looking to my right at what I thought could be a rainbow. Despite the sun, a light wind blew the rain about like scattered sand. And when I followed his gaze, it seemed to be fixed on either a fish restaurant or a soup display, or maybe backwards in time to the memory of a rainbow. Why did he stop me? I'd been dawdling staring at people on business lunches, restaurants like high-end clinics etherized on white wine. I must have been the only one to catch his eye, to hold it. What color could I see? I tried to picture the full spectrum arrayed in stained glass, shining sadly, and then refracted through a single shade that appeared to me in the form of a freshly mown lawn, a stack of banknotes, a cartoon frog, a row of pines, an unripe mango, a septic wound. I saw the glen beside the tall elm tree where the sweetbriar smells so sweet, then the lane in Devon where my dad grew up, and the river in Riau where my mum played. It was blue and yellow mixed like Howard Hodgkin's version of a Bombay sunset or pistachio ice cream, a jade statue of the Buddha. I remembered being asked, forced to give my favorite color by a teacher. Why did it matter? which was the colour of my favourite Power Ranger, of the knight beheaded by Gawain, of the green girdle given to him by Lady Bertolai, and chose the same again. The paper in your hand, if it is your colour, will bring you luck, and if not, he trailed off. First hold it to your forehead, then the back of your neck, then blow. I unscrunched the ball. Now put it here, he said, opening his wallet, and money please. I had no cash. Nothing. He looked me in the eyes and said again that he was a holy man. I felt honor bound to give him something. Up and down the street, men rode to their important offices. I told him it was my favorite color or had been. And as I did, I saw us from a distance as we might seem years from now. Scraps of colored fabric draped across a hall which taken out of context signified nothing. And I flinched, waiting for the blade to fall. Thank you, Will. Thanks for reading that. And thank you for everyone who's attending um, tonight's event. Thank you as well, April, for inviting us and for the OWL team. Maybe I should say a little bit about mastering English. When I came here at 16 as a migrant, I came here with a view of wanting to look for a better chance in life for, for us, for me and my mother and for the whole family, really. Um, I, we didn't come here to master English. We didn't come here to speak like Harry Potter. But it's, it, it seems quite sad to me that even though the world of linguistic is quite wide and it continues widening, it still reverts back to Queen's English, to the proper diction, proper grammar. Um, you can't obviously see how the poem appears on the page, but it appears as a set of questionnaire, like an English test exam. And there are two little tick boxes that you could tick and you could choose answers on. Mastering English. In the UK, when they say the sky is not working, they mean God is too high to hear your prayers, the television channel. The phrase, a drop in the ocean, indicates very little amount in comparison to what is expected or needed. All the migrants who mysteriously vanish at sea. An arm and a leg is the constellation Marara, deity of rain clouds, seen from the porch where your colleague housemate used to sit with her younger brother what she says as she turns off her heater. What does, I'm just popping out, mean? A man rattling a bolted door, adamant to fetch his daughter from school, even if his daughter has already had daughters of her own. 
your lie when you left your child to work in another country. If the charge nurse declares it's neither here nor there, you must understand it as something unimportant or irrelevant, an opportunity to ask, where is it then? Wow, thank you for both of those readings. I'm struck, Roma, by the use of mastering in the title. Of course, there's the familiar use of the word mastering in terms of a language, but there's also the word master embedded inside and this idea of power and almost this idea of reversing a kind of colonial uh, relationship there. Um, and Will, I feel that there's also a really interesting power dynamic in your poem as well with the green and green as as a form of money, um, which is also a way of expressing power and this kind of alienation that comes from that. Um, so I was interested both in this idea of do you feel that these poems um, allow a reclaiming of power in that way, um, and also what it means to write these poems in English, whether um, as English as an additional language or English as uh, the native language. Um, shall I say that? Shall I answer that first? Um, English is my second language. It's, it's an additional language for me. And it's quite difficult. When, we, when, when I read from this book, and when I think when I read a lot of comments or reviews from this book, a lot of people can only see what the book is about, you know, like, oh, this is about identity, migration, about this young woman who came here because her mother was a nurse, brought the family back, and now she's also a nurse. And it's about that sort of um, loss and pain and fracture and healing. But for me, going back to what identity really is, what the book is really about, it, it, it's not exactly what the book is saying to the audience it's more about how the book is saying it or how the poems are saying it so when you say april that um reclaiming and reclaiming that power and that power that is either taken away from us or power that is not given to us in the first place before we came from different background from from, from a background that doesn't really exist in in the uk literary scene um i i was I was thinking about that a lot, and I did, I did want to, to reclaim a, 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 some sort of power to in through through my poem, through mastering English, and also through through showing to the audience that actually this is me. You know, my my grammar is simple, my lines are fractured, and this is what the book is about. <laughs> about. Um, I, I was reading a book, um, an anthology recently from the early 90s, edited by Essex Hemp Hemphill called Brother to Brother, and it's sort of um, black, um, queer, male poets, and it has a, a quote on the back to Audre Lorde where she says that self-definition is the core of power, and that felt really true to me, but then, as you say, it's kind of fraught by so many other things, by, well, you can't, I mean, by the fact that you can define yourself and you can make space of a page, but you still have to live in a world in which other people are defining you, in which these other definitions press on you. And I really like, and um, sometimes can believe in the idea that writing is a kind of reclaiming of power. Um, but, maybe it kind of comes also from a feeling of being powerless and of how little and, and of the real kind of power, you know, power relations that determine the lives of so many people in the world. Hmm. I'm really glad that, Will, that you brought up um, an anthology, a sort of identity anthology. Um, and Roman, you were also talking about identity earlier. Um, one anthology that I've been thinking a lot about lately is um, this one, it's IE, um, an anthology of Asian American writers. And it was first published in 1974. Um, and that was during a period when 
uh, the definition of Asian American was really um, becoming more solidified and, and changing and evolving. And this anthology is really interesting because the Asian American writers are um, only Chinese, Japanese, and Filipino. And uh, obviously that, that sort of identity has broadened out over time um, and now um, it's much more inclusive. And um, I'm curious about your thoughts about what that sort of identity might mean in the UK or is there even an identity in the UK? Um, I think I've noticed that in the past year uh, with some of the coronavirus related hate crime in the UK, there's been maybe an increasing sense of identity among East and Southeast Asian um, heritage peoples here. Um, there's a report that was just published this week on discrimination, discrimination and racialization um, among populations here. Um, but there's also a drive among others to do away with these sort of collective identities. There's the term BAME in UK uh, for Black, Asian, minority, ethnic, and others are saying that we should, we should scrap sort of collective identities like that and just go with whatever specific, you know, identity people have, um, whether it's British Nigerian or British Vietnamese or so on. Um, what are your thoughts? Do you, do you have, what is your identity? Does it, is it relevant? Is there anything to be gained by creating some kind of group identity um, in the UK? Yeah. Again, it's it's a really complicated question. I guess there are there are two sides to it. I mean, for me, in the last few years, it's meant a huge amount to because um, I, I grew up. My my mom came over when she was very young, and she was Chinese Indonesian, so the kind of minority within a minority in Indonesia, and uh, she didn't have very many kind of. Um, friends from that community growing up, so I didn't really grow up with many role models, and then obviously there weren't many in the writing community. Um, but then I was lucky enough to get onto this mentoring scheme and was mentored by a poet called Sarah Howe, who was, you know, one of the first East, like, women, uh, women poets, in, yeah, of any <laughs> gender of East Asian heritage to, like, publish with a major press and to win awards and and just seeing what she could do and the ways in which she could self-define and the kind of, and then that, that felt like it kind of ushered in a new, uh, lo lots of other younger poets like me who, um, but then, and, and it was very empowering. It's empowering to kind of feel like there are other people who are kind of facing some of the questions, but then obviously there's the risk of flattening out your own sense of the world. And particularly, I mean, Asian is obviously the kind of most absurdly broad, word it like covers like half of the world's population you know asian and within britain i mean all the like poets of asian heritage i know whose work i love like then there's like no <laughs> there are no real links between them like when i think of you know poets who are you know from from hong kong who are glaswegian chinese who are um mauritian who are i mean just there are yeah and there is a danger which has always been the case with writers of color that we become complicit in our own um, fetishization. And it's a kind of something that we have to, and I mean, it's, it's like a kind of horrible responsibility, but yeah, you have to kind of have a kind of Janus vision of both. Um, similar to what Will is saying, I will echo that as well. Um, with me as a Filipino, well, technically I'm British now, but um, Filipino by heart, Filipino British by heart. Um, the Philippines, Filipinos, it's quite difficult to define the identity of the Filipinos because we were occupied by the Spaniards for more than 300 years and then the Americans and then the Japanese occupation happened as well in World War II. So what is identity really? It's like, it's, it's like our whole culture is a hot pot of so many different food um, and so many mixed ident identity. Having said that, I do believe that cultural identity and collective identity is important because it's something that um, molds you, molds your values, molds your, molds the person you are. But the problem with identity is, identity is expansive. It's not like a flat 2D, it's 3D, 4D even. 
um, especially when I came here, I was, I was quite, uh, you know, why, why did I come here? <laughs> why did my mom brought us over here? I couldn't, I couldn't understand their accents and I couldn't, I couldn't relate to them with, with all the idioms and all the sayings, et cetera, et cetera. And then I started writing. I started to, to want to shed light on the culture and the profession that I love. And, and that's a part of my identity. And that's a part of, I guess, um, reclaiming and also trying to lift that identity as well um, for me. But then again, it's quite difficult. The difficulty comes because for example, in my own experience, um, I, I was really happy to see other people of color or poets of color because I feel that, oh, at least I'm not alone. I feel that, oh, at least I could, I could say that poets of color can, can actually excel. And then there were a point in my life when I thought, oh, actually, when, <laughs> when they start to, you know, when they start to converse and when they start to speak, I get to think that, I'm really different from them, that we don't have the same accents or we don't have the same values even. So identity is complicated like that. There is a part of your identity that can be seen physically, a part of your identity that you alone can see or other people can see, but you cannot see. And a part of your identity that is also unknown to others and unknown to yourself until you actually discover that yourself or explore it yourself. Um, so it's quite complicated. I bet it is quite complicated, but I think it is important. And it is important as well to, to, to have that reflection of who am I, who, who, who I am. So, yeah. That's great. Um, I love this idea of identity being something that can bring you closer to other people, but that you also want to keep for yourself, that you want to stay independent in. Um, and one situation in which um, sometimes we don't have choice in having that independence is in um, when it comes to white supremacy, which is, I think, something a lot of people have been thinking about lately after the capital attacks. And um, you both have poems that deal in, with white supremacy in different ways. So Ramlan, I was wondering if you could read the poem dedicated to your grandfather and Will, if you could read your Richard Spencer poem. Yes. Um, so the, ne the poem that I'm going to read is called The Shaman, The Servant. Um, I came from a clan of healers. My grandfather, my grandparents actually, they were shamans and shamaness and um, albolario, what we call albolario. My mother is a nurse. My aunties are nurses. I turned out to be a nurse. <laughs> so we're all healers. And this poem attempts to explore how those two healing professions are viewed from two different sides of the continent. But I guess it also explores how distance and time can separate people. The shaman, the servant, for my grandfather. And while you were oiling your hands with langis ahas, whispering incantations to the hammock of your palm, I pushed a needle in and the patient fainted. And while you could erase a headache with a blow of breath or draw out poisons by placing buhay na bato on a serpent's bite, I could only clean mold on a wound bed with gauze and saline. And while there was a queue of villagers at your door, when stars at dawn were rock salts that buried scarab legs in glass vials, a pack outside Lidl trailed me on their bicycles, shouting Ching Chong. And while your house grew with gifts, a rooster crowing in a bayong, a sack of corn, whips of ripe jackfruits, a patient woke and accused me of stealing her job. And when you stash your chants into a chink in the ceiling beam and dialed the telephone, all I could say was, I am fine and I've got to go. Once you took in a hawk and bandaged its wing with kakawate leaves. And had I known that by August, the phone would fur with dust, I would have pressed the handset to my ear. 
instead of telling you, I've got to go, it's midnight here. This is beautiful. Um, so I guess this kind of follows on from that conversation in that, um, so kind of just what I was saying, I think um, solidarity is hugely important in for almost from like a kind of organizational point of view, um, you know, recognizing kind of similarities across differences in order to organize against white supremacy, for example. But it's important not to, to lose the kind of different texture of our like individual experiences and oppressions. And that is in the nature of fascism to erase difference. And so I wrote this poem about a fascist called Richard Spencer. And I thought one of the only ways I could imagine responding, I mean, was to, in maybe a kind of slightly flippant, silly way, was to imagine his dream life. Because one of the things that kind of, I guess, feel like fascism as an idea threatens is our individual dream life. The, and in our dream lives, we are kind of ambiguous and ambivalent and strange to ourselves. And that's the kind of baseline right, right that everyone should have, the ability to be strange to themselves. Seven Dreams of Richard Spencer. One. Once I woke up with the actual gilded horns of a cuck, and you admired them, and assured me I need not fear dreams that pass through the horned gates. But then I turned into a yellow cowfish, flopping on the bed, and you picked me up by my small horns and flushed me down the toilet. Two. Once I believed myself to be a cuckoo, when, in fact, I was a pair of binoculars looking at a cuckoo. I hung around your neck, swaying on the drive home, where you left me on the seat. There I turned into a moat of dust. The next day, you sat in silence, the churring call of a nightjar outside, while I nested in your eye. Three. Once I was a cucumber, and you pretended I was useful, but when I said I was a Gurkha, speaking German fluently, you tried to pickle me. I remember wanting to turn into a kitten or something cute, but ended up as a novelty keychain key for real estate brokers called Big Dicks. Four. Once I was the chlorine in a public swimming pool, and I flowed into the open gills of a woman I believed to be my mother, before it occurred to me that my mother isn't young and doesn't have gills. I turned into a macrophage and was able to see that the woman I believed to be my mother was addled with cancer. So I started to eat my way through every cell I came across, not because I wanted to save her, but because it tasted good. Five. Once Europe was a market square, and though it wasn't market day, I'd come to sit and drink hot chocolate and listen to the buskers, one of whom was singing Schumann's Dichterlieber, which for some reason you thought was bleeding love. It's not, I said. But later I heard Leona Lewis's voice in the flapping of the pigeons outside the National Museum. The exhibits on loan had been replaced by photographs. Each time I tried to touch one, it moved. You better back the fuck off, said the security guard. I turned into a boy and girl who had lost their parents and we hugged each other, crying. Six, once the rain fell in vertical girders and I thought I could walk between them, pressing my cheek against their cold surface, but a mansion rose about me several floors high and a voice called telling me to leave. Father, I said, why have you forsaken me? I turned into a great eyeball and still he looked away. So I turned into a frog and slipped without a sound into a mill pond. Seven, once I was not myself or another man or either of their lips exactly, but the expression of a kiss they shared. And at first I have to say it was beautiful, but then I felt myself turning into or no, recognizing myself as a desert flower, which was even better. Those were fantastic. Ramlin, in your poem, the Ching Chong, I love how you rhyme it with the Bayong. Uh, it's like almost kind of subversive how you bring that in as a contrast. And it feels that the Ching Chong, this like small little sound of white supremacy is an intrusion in this intimate dialogue between the speaker and the speaker's grandfather. Um, so almost that 
that you're writing about white supremacy from the outside, that it's still remaining on the outside. Um, well, you've obviously taken a very different approach, um, a very funny one. And um, I think the thing that is disturbing in the poem is that it creates a kind of empathy for Richard Spencer, this person who we really want to hate, um, who, we, who we need to, to not um, have empathy for um, in some ways. Um, and so I was curious about your decision-making processes, um, because I think Romland to, to include that little word, Ching Chong, in your poem is, um, is a big move. And, and the same for you, Will, to, to write from the inside. Um, the decision process, did you say, April? Um, I think when we're writing, from a place where we've been hurt or mocked or or silenced, it's it's quite difficult because there's a lot of emotions there. And if you're the sort of a poet like me, <laughs> who's writing with knowing that I want to to also express these emotions and express these horrible things that's happening in in people like me. I, I I could really get overboard. Thankfully, there's that the editing process. But when we when I start to think about which which words should I um, should I choose or should I take out or which is too much or which is not, it's really it's really more about for me not just the little nuances like you, like you said with the ching chong and the bayong. Um, that's really my that, that that is really how I wanted it to come across. But actually, you're calling me Ching Chong. But then actually, I could just throw another Tagalog word which you don't know and could rhyme in it. So that's that's like my way of mocking you a little bit or um, taking a joke out of your joke about me. So again, that recl reclamation of power um, is number one. Uh, why why am i why am i using this word it's not just because someone has said it to me no it's it's also because it's important in the process of my poem in order for me to reclaim that power that's that's taken away and i think that's that's the heart of it for me um <clears throat> i guess for me uh, in terms of like the the ethics of empathizing with a racist. I, go, I guess, I, well, firstly, I don't really think I am doing that in that poem. And I guess there is like a like kind of long tradition of writing about this. There's that amazing essay by Sartre about the like portrait of the anti-Semite. Um, but where the kind of like act of imagining yourself into that position is the kind of like negation of it. But I guess in this case, I thought, on a more just, again, flippant level, it was the thing that would kind of most kind of annoy someone like Richard Spencer was to imagine like very tender dreams that you might have. Like, and also with a lot of alt-right rhetoric, it kind of tries to like draw you into a pseudo logic. And the worst thing you can do is to, to take part in that, that logic. <laughs> so, um, so that was, again, another, another kind of influence on it. Yeah, I, I feel like there's also some subtle ways that a kind of white supremacist logic infuse themselves in, in the dreams that you've created. Um, there's that line about the chlorine, which is this cleaning and also killing agent. And it feels very non-accidental in the piece. Um, but I wanted to um, also discuss this idea of use of speech, um, use of speech um, as a kind of reclamation as we've been speaking about, um, and also as a kind of incantation, um, as a way to act against forgetting or irrelevance or even death. Um, and two of your poems, I think, work really incredibly in concert. Um, so Roman, could you read names and then we'll say? Um, 
maybe I should say this, that I have mentioned before that my mother, who was a nurse, brought the family over to the UK. Um, that kind of separation doesn't only happen to me. It happens to so many children who are left behind by their parents um, in search of a better life somewhere else, like abroad or in a different city. And it's actually a, a phenomena left behind children exist and transnational families exist. And I guess this poem explored that. Names. We are nameless and all names are ours. Emmanuel Lacaba. My mother's name is Rosana, but when she left, I had other mothers, Rowena, Jimboy, Alma. I was named after the first syllables of my parents. I will always have them with me. My mother says, not all names have meaning. Riverside, Manila, London, Corva. And someday I will forget all the commands I did not heed, like the time I did not spin the plate clockwise before my father left for work, even if it would deliver him from accidents. Not all destinations are found in the junctions of your palm lines. Say, better life. Say, better life. And God knows I am repenting. Say, Airbus something, say one-way ticket, keep following the sunset. Clouds are the closest things to my mother. Say United Kingdom, say the Queen, NHS. Does winter always mean? Listen, can you hear it? The loneliness of stretchers along a &E corridors. And the strongest part of me is the scar I hide underneath my fringe. My mother hides in the staff toilet to make long distance calls. Someday I will realize the woman lonely in her mansion is not my mother, but a future version of myself. I will chop bitter guards on the galaxy glimmer of her worktop. Shall we shorten your name on your name tag so it's easier to remember? Say yes, please, sister. Say please, sister, can I take this call? Say Arnold Marcus Harold. Say Citicimia alcohol poisoning hernia. Say Jason Darius Vernon. Say cancer myocardial infarction query schizophrenia. Hides in the toilet. And I have the first syllables of my parents' names. That is why I am not scared. A boy sticks out his tongue and says I do not have a mother. I punch him in the face. The sanctity of blood. I am not scared. Because my mother has followed the sunset. Because she has burnt her lips on mash and gravy in a three-minute lunch break. Because she calls me Anak, my child, my baby. She asks, what do you want for Christmas? For your birthday? 1990 remains stuck on the other line. Say, please, sister, can I take this call? My breasts blossom. She can call me only by my name. I have the first syllables of my parents' names. That is why I am not scared. I can trek the mountain of Makolot, my father's rifle hanging from my back. I can carry myself not how someone carries a cytotoxic drug, but how my mother hooks with her finger a drained bottle with blood clots, the weight of gemstones. Amazing. Um, uh, I guess. Yeah, I find I find this poem quite quite hard to read, um, and it's mostly about my dad, who I who is white, um, and who I do love, um, though you might not get that might not come fully across from the poem. Um, and he was very ill a few years ago. Say. 
a brick-sized block of grey stone washed ashore on which was carved the word say. My dad picked it up at low tide and two months later found another and another saying les. We worked out that rather than a command like Rilke's flow, it was the name of an old firm, Sales, which sold refined sugar with plantations in the Caribbean and a factory in Chiswick. As capital flows, accumulates and breaks its bounds, so too had sales broken into various subsidiaries, slipped, dissolved and loosed. You find all kinds of things at low tide. One time a black retriever came wagging up to me with a jawbone in its mouth. What can't be disposed of otherwise, what can't be broken down, is taken by the river, spat out or lodged in mud. The sabric took pride of place on our chest of drawers. Masonry defaced by time made part of the furniture. My dad decided to give it to you, in part because you're an artist and he thought it looked like art, but also which is maybe the same because it suggested reason and madness and made him, made us less afraid. Last week, there was an acid attack. Two cousins assumed to be Muslim, having torn off their clothes, lay naked on the curb, calling for help. Passers-by cross the road, Things break, not flow. It is impossible, however lovely, to see the whole of humanity as a single helix rotating forever in the midst of universal time. Flow, break, flow. That's how things go, is it? What are you trying to say? After the operation, they stapled shut his stomach. As the scars healed, it became harder to discuss. He drank as if he had no body, nothing said, admitted to, or broken. Flow, break, flow, gather up the fragments. Now he's back to saying, the country's full. Why are they all men? Four months ago, in a flimsy hospital gown, the fight had almost left him. In a tone you use to distract a child, the nurse told my mum about her holiday to Sumatra in the early 90s. He likes custard, she replied. We told him when to cough and when to breathe. He clasped a button that controlled the morphine. Bleep, bleep. What did the blue and green lines mean? The sudden dips? What was the nurse's name? I chose not to keep notes. Thoughtful as moss or black coffee or as the screen of a dead phone, that's what eyes look like when you really look at them, inanimate. Moss, though, is alive enough to harvest carbon dioxide to grow. Yesterday I googled thoughtful as moss, thinking it was from a Seamus Heaney poem, but only found a description of the poet grown long-haired and thoughtful, a woodkern escaped from the massacre. At school we learned that woodkerns were armed peasants who fought against the British in Ireland. I imagined them and him as thoughtful kernels, seeds that had escaped death by being spat out. I am nothing so solid or durable. What are you trying to say? For years, I made patterns in the air, not knowing what to say. Then you came and pointed out the paintwork cracked and bubbling on the wall beside my bed, which though it stank, I hadn't noticed. The street light sparked on beads of damp, your skin smelt bready, warm. I couldn't say how bare my life had been. The stillness in the room was like the stillness in the air between the heaves of storm. We flowed into and out of each other, saying, what? saying, not yet together we were incapable of breaking, cradled in pure being. The paint flaked, exposing streaks of poxy wall. I remembered a church where the saints' faces had been scratched away, taking on a new expression, alien, afraid. Some days I must look alien to him, scary. One poet said the devil was neither blatant nor scour, incapable of being scared. I sleep scared most nights, but feel no more holy. Once I pronounced oven often, like my mum does, and a friend laughed. The cracks appeared beneath me. In the years before we met, though I wrote, I was too scared, too scarred to speak. Flow, flow, flow. I wanted to be carried along, not spat out or upon the say brick picked from the riverbed, proved that broken things still flow. What are you trying to say? When you asked me that, I closed my laptop, offended. Why? It never mattered what I said. Whether you speak up or scarcely whisper, you speak with all you are. To the eye of a being of incomparably longer life, to God or the devil, 
the human race would appear as one continuous vibration in the same way a sparkler twirled at night looks like a circle. In darker days, I couldn't say that to my dad, slumped in front of the TV with a mug of instant coffee. Saying it now only makes me think of times I've held a sparkler, the hiss and flare, the after smell, which runs counter to that whole vision. One morning, gagging on his breathing tube, he started to text my mum, but before he could press send, his phone died. He couldn't remember what he tried to say. I can't remember what I tried to say. Flow, break, flow. You hear me though. That poem, both of those poems are just overwhelming. Thank you so much. I'm really struck by this almost like unbearable emotion contained in both of these poems. Um, you were saying, Will, that, that it's a difficult poem for you to read. Um, and it, it, the poems both feel very bare in a way, and, and they're dealing not just with the speaker, but also with the speaker's relations and people who are important to the speaker. So I was curious, and I think this is possibly something that a lot of people listening today may also consider as they write. How do you choose how much to reveal in your poems? And how do you protect both yourself as poet or poet speaker or as lyric eye? Um, and how do you also protect those around you? Um, if I'm honest, I don't really think about that because I guess I think I'm writing a poem and poetry and I was talking about this with my friend Nisha, I think for both of us, we were saying it's always felt like a way of hiding. So I actually, ne I never really feel like I'm revealing that much, even when it is personal. I never think, what am I, you know, should I keep that back? Um, it's a way of both hiding, hiding and disclosing something in a kind of safe place. And I guess if I was writing a novel or like a play or something, those questions would probably be there. But I mean, yeah, that's my main thing. So what was the first part of the question? I can't. Yeah. About, about, yeah, protecting yourself and those around you, but choosing how much to reveal. Yeah, it's a hard question. I guess, in a way, that poem, so, I mean, just to take that as an example, I, I, I wrote it after a long time of not writing, and and I think, like, with a lot of poems I feel the most close to, that, to me, is about trying to say something. I wasn't even thinking about my dad. I was just thinking about, I guess, well, I was thinking about all the things, the conversations I hadn't had with my put, with my dad. And in particular, this moment when, like before he went off to have this operation and how much there wasn't, there hadn't been expressed between us. And, and I, I kind of think it, may, it makes me think of a lot of poets I love, particularly um, poets of color. And, and they, they focus on speaking, on speech, on expression, and how important that is. To us you know how often you feel like silenced and constricted and how that can kind of taint infect family relationships as well anyway and everything kind of flowed from that it didn't really it didn't start off as a poem about this traumatic thing that happened and me being like oh how do i write about this you know you know if you see what i mean i wasn't like you know do i reveal this do i not re you know it came from just this kind of almost deeper thing of how do i speak how do I find a way to speak anything at all? And then I kind of followed the, a chain of whatever subconscious images led to those words. I'm sorry, I feel like I talked too long. Um, for me, I think it's quite difficult to, or it's quite problematic to assume that what the poet is writing about came from his or her own experiences. It's, it's, it's particularly difficult, difficult for me because obviously I'm a nurse and I'm a migrant initially. So a lot of people 
automatically thinks that this is very autobiographical and that kind of undermines the narrative and the imaginative effort that I put in this book somehow. So I guess it's quite difficult um, to, to think that, oh, this is about their lives. When I, when I was writing the book, I came across an interview with one of my favorite poets, Li Yang Li, online somewhere on YouTube. And he said something like, um, something about how poetry how language is the score of the human voice. And that's what I really wanted to do with this collection. I wanted the collection to speak from the voices of the people who were left behind, the children who were left behind, the migrant, the migrant parents, the nurses who have been invisible all these years, um, but made scene when the government said, oh, let's clap for them and let's shed some light on them. So for me, when I was writing this poem, it's not really about what I am ready to reveal or what I want to take out. Um, it's more about what is my purpose on writing this poem? What's the heart of it? What do I, what do I want this to achieve? I always go back with, um, when I say that it's quite problematic to, to assume that a poem is, is um, uh, is a story of that poet. I think it's partly because we are also assuming that when the poet writes it, then that means that she's just expressing her experiences, that she's just basically, um, you know, having some kind of diarrhea <laughs> of her experiences, um, an outpour of experiences on the page. But for me, poetry and language, like you said, April, um, language is more, more about that um, Denis Levertov even said that it's not just more about elimination, but it's also absorption. Language heals too. Language heals not only the poet, but also the people who read it, because people would read it and say, oh, you know what, Will, that, that narrative is really like, um, you know, I, I really felt bad because, because you, you, you managed to, to, put, to, to access my empathy channel in my brain or they could say oh Romaline <laughs> that poem is, is it really struck my heart because I came from the migrant background as well so I, I think that's that's more that that's my point and that's my, more of my purpose rather than thinking what can I reveal and what I cannot I guess that 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 happens in the editing stage but not initially when I'm writing these poems mm, mm, yeah I, I like both of your thoughts about how language and speaking acts as a conduit, both for revealing and concealing simultaneously. And that's really wonderful. We are going to move to a little Q&A if anyone has questions either on Zoom or on YouTube. Uh, but in the meanwhile, I'd like us to do one final send off poem. I hope everyone who's listening in has a drink ready, whether it's coffee or something stronger. And um, Roman, could you please read your Tengai poem? Yes, I will. Um, so, um, before I read this, I just want to say thank you again, April, and thank you, A-A-W-W or O, I don't really know how to pronounce it, um, for inviting us. Will, it's been a pleasure to read with you. I've always liked you ever since we first met like two years ago, I think, was it two years ago in London? You're such a nice guy and, and, and congratulations um, on your every success. I'm really happy for you. Um, so Tagai, Tagai is, actually the poem's title is Tagai or Drinking Lambanog with my Filipino colleagues. Tagay is a Tagalog word that means cheers or pour me some more, and that's why we need some drink. So when Filipinos migrate, and anyone, when anybody migrates, it's quite difficult, isn't it? So it's very natural to create that sense of community, that sense of togetherness. And when Filipino, especially overseas Filipino migrants, get to know each other, um, they normally host parties and they normally gather each other around a table sipping some uh, coconut wine eating some food and that act that act symbolize 
establishing a community in a faraway country, but also but also um, providing each other resilience and and in strength for each other. And when I when I raise my glass, what I'll do is in this poem, every stanza is a voice of a Filipino migrant worker. So what I'll do is I'm wondering if you could help me with this. Every time I say it's my turn and then raise the glass, we should all say tagai. Can we unmute everyone's mic just to practice? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Right. Okay, unmute. <laughs> right. So it's just a practice. Every stanza begins with it's my turn and then I'll raise it and we'll tagai it. Well, cheers to all our pain. Okay, right. It's my turn. Tagai. <laughs> Good. Um, right. Tagai. Um, just, just maybe, just shout a little bit more. <laughs> Can we practice one, one once more? Just, just think like, oh, you know what? One day. It's okay that it's just us now because one day we'll be able to go home. We'll be able to kiss our family again. We'll be able to, to touch and hug our friends again. It's basically what's happening now. We're in lockdown at the moment. So one day we'll be able to go out and see all our loved ones again. One more time, one more practice. When you say tagai, say it with all your heart. <laughs> like tagai, we can do it. Okay, right. It's my turn. Tagai! That's it. That's it. Much better. Okay. You ready? Will, you were born ready, I know. <laughs> Tagay, or drinking lambanog with my Filipino colleagues. It's my turn. Tagay! This 80 proof our talisman for survival. One day we'll go home. I'll go home and scan the crowd for the smile that opens only to me at arrivals. It's my turn. Tagay! Tagay. <laughs> the window is pockmarked by hailstones, but someday Manila's heat will smother us and thaw our frosted lungs. My veins will throb in the orchestra of jeepneys. The road quivers in their silver shimmer. I'll hop on and hunch along the aisle to sit in the sliver of gap between passengers, their sweat slicked arms fused to mine. It's my turn. Tagai! When I get home, my bag will burst with Toblerone and Cadbury. My children will lick the melted years off their palms as they listen to my story of the giant of Mount Montalban who shakes his leg to make earthquakes. But at night, my wife and I are certain true belonging is where curtains unfasten and a kiss clicks like a bedside lamp where earthquakes happen on top or underneath our bed linen. Now it's my turn. Tagay! I imagine each day as a dating gawi, just like the old times. Tito and I will flag down a tricycle, jodder over potholes, inhale the town's exhaust on the way to Lipas Panciteria. Bowls of lomi will thump in front of us, its soup thickened with cassava flour. The meat chunk odor of Mickey noodles oozes through crammed toppings of liver slices and pork scratchings. Until then, Tagay! Tagay! It's my turn. Light shatters in the dregs of this bottle. Tomorrow, we'll be changing bed covers, soaking dentures, creaming cracked heels. But before I know it, I'll be with my brother, driving to San Juan along the Larimar gloss of the ocean. Our skin brined and burnt will feel the jerk of curled Pamela trunks as we backflip and splatter into clear waters. We'll lie in a rainbow hammock, drowsy in the clutter of coffee shell wind chimes. It's my turn. Tagad. In this flat, we stink like sardinas. Soon, I'll trace the nut-sweet hint of pan de coco 
in a woven canister on the back of a peddler's bicycle. Caselli will call from the corner, Kailan ka dumating? When did you return? She's as young as the day I left, is still pegging tinapa fish on the laundry line. When the midday sun sears my nape, my schoolmates and I will congregate on the terrace, passing around the karaoke mic and a chaser of coconut wine. As the alcohol knocks everyone out, like the summer that pummeled Pacquiao, I will saunter with my childhood crush in my Lolo's orchard under the chandelier of jade vines. This last shot is mine. I've just arrived and autumn has already settled in my eyes. I'll get used to the English cold. Each time I push a plunger, I'll find in the needle tip bead a mangrove lagoon. If I endure, I'll earn enough for Papa's heart operation. Here's to you. Okay. Okay. Soon, a morning will explode into the comfort fume of birds droppings in a basement that beats with 80,000 balin sasayaw, I'll harvest their dense saliva nest on the ceiling and tweezer out the stock feathers before boiling them in chicken stock. It would be just like the old times. Papa and I will slurp bowls of nest soup as we sit on cracked upturned pots amongst the hematoma of flowers. Until then, I'll wear double double layers. Until then, bye guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope we passed your test, Ramlin. Um, so we have time for a couple questions. Uh, the first one uh, is from Helen Kwa, uh, following up on the discussion we were just having earlier about poetry as a form of concealing. And she was curious if, um, if Will, you could speak more about writing poetry as a form of hiding, what that means. Okay, uh, that was actually my friend Nisha who said that. But yeah, I feel, I feel the same way too. Um, I guess because if you wanted to express something clearly, you wouldn't I don't think you would write a poem. Well, that to me is not what I go to poems for. Um, I go, I mean, I go for them for the kind of like complexity of emotion, for a kind of language which is self-aware about all the kind of different things that it can hold and contain, that a word, can, you know, that a word can contain, that a line can contain when it's broken. And um I guess that's what I'm. That's what I mean by by hiding. Um, I go, and also it's like um, Romlin was saying. You know, it, what's exciting about a poem to me is that it's a form of speech, which isn't kind of personal speech in some ways. You know, I think even more so than a, a, a novel where you know narrative. You kind of want to fit it to a person. But poetry is by its nature kind of a performance in a way. You don't read a poet, you know, the, the eye in a poem is never just the eye on the front cover of the book. And that to me is also exciting and opens out the possibilities of expression. You can kind of hide among voices, among, yeah, I guess within the kind of shades of language. I don't know if that makes sense. That's great. And just, yeah, Romlin, I think you might have something to say about that too. There's so many voices in your text. Uh, and do, did you have something? You look like you're about to speak. Oh, no, I wasn't. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, okay, well, we have um, also a question from Lu Hai. Um, and this is for both or either of you. How did you find and maintain the confidence to, parentheses, constantly? submit your poetry. I suppose since both of you have editorial roles as well, so Romlin, um, you 
our co-editor for Ambit, as well as a co-founding editor of, um, of Piranha Poetry. And Will, I know you also have some editorial roles at um, the Rialto and PNR. Um, so maybe you can speak to this on both sides, both on the submitting and the um, editing side. For me, I think it's very natural to feel scared to submit or to even write a, a new poem on a black, black page. Um, it's, it's very natural to have writer's block or it's very natural to have fears of getting rejected. Um, but the main question that I keep asking myself is, who am I writing for and to whom am I writing for? And that those questions seem to give me a little power to remind myself that actually I'm not writing just to get published, you know, because I know I'll get published. It's just a matter of time. I just need to, I just need to craft better poems. But for me, I'm writing for these people, these people who have been invisible in the literary scene. This, I'm writing for a culture and a profession that I love. And I think that's, that's, that's enough for me um, to, to kind of like move on. Yeah, I, I would say I'm really bad at it. I, I, I still, um, I don't know if that's helpful, but I just, yeah, every rejection just makes me think I should never, never write again. <laughs> and I still, still feel like that. Um, but I guess the big shift for me um, was, I guess similar to what Rome was saying was, but discovering a kind of community of other writers and kind of, I think for a long time, I felt like it was just kind of me versus like the establishment or like the world. And I was just like setting my poems up and it was like, ah, oh, you hate them, you hate me. And I was like, just kind of made me more embittered. But then I just kind of discovered other writers and we started sharing work together. And um, that was kind of gave me something to kind of fall back on that, you know, that ultimately if I had a few people who I felt trusted in who I trusted in and who you know whose work uh, whose yeah if there was mutual trust essentially then that kind of made them. um and yeah I was it were you asking about submitting to yeah read about reading submissions yeah that, that'd be a nice thing to speak about too um yeah, I haven't done it that much recently. Well, I edited, I co-edited this um, poetry review issue with Mary Jean Chan, which was really exciting. And I liked it because it was a one-off, which was, because it was a lot of work. And I really was quite invested in reading every submission and responding to, to each of them in detail. Um, because also I kind of think that I don't really believe in what in good or bad. I just believe in I mean, I, th I think everyone who sent work in was saying something interesting and I kind of, I may not have responded or maybe it may not have fitted with what we wanted for that issue, but I kind of wanted to kind of try and convey that <laughs> to, to everyone. Um, and I can't imagine the nightmare of doing that, you know, editing full time because then you would actually, I don't know how, how you, yeah, it's, it's a tough job. Maybe Rom Rom Roma has insight. Sorry, um, what was the question about that bit again? <laughs> Do you have any advice to people who are submitting poetry from your, not with your poet hat on, but with your editor hat on? I think it's really good to read the magazine, read the kind of poems that we publish, and keep on reading. It could be that you're there, but it's just that you're not just there yet. <laughs> So a lot of reading, a lot of, retr of, of redrafting, writing and redrafting. And I think you'll get there. It's, you know, you can, you can do it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a matter of getting up every time you fall, I think. Don't, don't worry about rejections. Everybody gets rejected. Honestly, I've got so many rejections, but they are just a thing of the past. And one day you will say to yourself, it's going to be a thing of the past. And even if I get rejected now, it doesn't matter because I have friends, like what Will is saying. I have friends who support me. I have friends who who look into my work. I have friends who I could trust. And I think that's the most important thing. That's great. Uh, that is such a hopeful note to end on. We are sort of at the end of our time, but hopefully here, a lot of the people listening also know that they have 
a, a place, a community as well in the Asian American Writers Workshop. So thank you so much, Juan Roma, and also Lily for having us here. Thank you all so much. I want to call for a round of sort of virtual applause in the chat on Zoom and on YouTube for our poets for April. Um, thank you for just such a beautiful conversation, for such incredible readings. We're so grateful and so glad that everyone joined us on Saturday. Um, I have a couple of very quick closing notes, but before I do so, I just want to recognize and thank everyone um, for the conversation, the wisdom, the cheers in the chat. Um, it's been such a pleasure, pleasure to kind of watch the concurrent conversation um, alongside Will and Romalyn and April. Um, so thank you all for engaging. Thank you again for being here. Um, next week at AAWW on Tuesday, January 26, we're gonna stream a conversation between novelist Simon Han and scholar Tasim Shams on our YouTube page that I highly recommend um, and hope you will join to watch. That Thursday, the 28th, we're going to present a multidisciplinary launch and celebration of the work that the Black Women Radicals and Asian American Feminist Collectives have done um, over at the margins in collaboration with AAWW. Um, some really exciting events and, and things coming up, which you can find more out about on AAWW.org. Um, we want to thank our friends at Books Are Magic once again for um, helping us with book sales this season. There is a link to purchase uh, books in the chat that you may need to scroll up a little bit. Um, there's also social media links for all of our poets and um, for April as well. Uh, finally, I just want to note really quickly that this event was recorded. It will be on our YouTube channel shortly. It will also be a podcast episode on our podcast, AEWW Radio. So if you want to return to it, share with friends, um, share with colleagues, you will be able to do so. Um, and I think that's all from us. Thank you so much again, Will and Romalyn and April. This was a true pleasure and we're so grateful that you joined us in our, our virtual event space and we hope to gather in person at some point in the future. So thank you all so much.